Here we go. So hopefully you're now seeing a slide that says landscapes and coastal environment projects. So that's the that's what this conversation is all about today. Um, we've got five panelists with us, and as I mentioned, um, the first thirty minutes of this live live meeting is a presentation from them. So we're going to hear first from Jeremy Butler, who's Tasman District Council Urban and Rural Development Policy Team Leader, about what the landscapes and coastal environment projects are and how they relate to the Tasman Environment Plan. Now, the Tasman Environment Plan you may have already come across this. It's the new resource management plan um, that's being created by Tasman District Council um, with lots of input along the way um, from our communities. So he's going to speak to that. Then we'll hear from Bridget Gilbert, who is the um, landscape architect who authored the Tasman District Landscape Study. So Bridget will talk to us about outstanding natural landscapes and outstanding natural features. Before passing over to James Bentley, who is the senior principal landscape architect um, who undertook the Tasman District Coastal Study. So he'll talk to us about the coastal environment. And then we'll hear from Stephanie Stiles, who's a senior principal planner, um, and she's going to fill us in on what all of this means, um, what it means for landowners um, and communities, and then how you can get involved. As we move through today's presentation, please feel free to submit questions along the way. Um, so the way to do this is through the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. You'll find a little Q&A button. When you click that, it opens up a chat box. And in that chat box, um, you can submit your questions. They all come through to me. And then in the second half of this presentation, I'll put them to, um, to the relevant panelists. And the other sort of quirk of, um, of this system is that there is also a chat function. And um, if you use that, unfortunately, it means that it doesn't get saved after this presentation. So we're not able to get back to you if we don't manage to make it to your question, um, which is something that we can do if you submit it through the Q&A. Also, it's a lot easier for me to keep track of questions that come in through the Q&A button. So I really do encourage you um, to use that if you can. All right, let's get started with Jeremy. Jeremy, you're on mute. Uh, had to do it sometime. Hello, thanks very much, Nicole. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody. Um, good evening. Um, and uh, yeah, as Nicole mentioned, I'm the team leader for the urban and rural uh, policy development. And I'm sort of managing this process on behalf of uh, Tasman District Council. Um, there's two um, main aspects to what we're addressing tonight, or two components to this project. One is uh, outstanding natural landscapes and features. Um, and Bridget will be talking about that further. And that really relates to our, uh, the landscapes uh, um, that are really special throughout Tasman and the certain features that are special. The second element of the, um, that, that we're talking about tonight is the coastal study, which James will talk about. And that's really much, uh, focused on um, identifying what is our coastal environment and, uh, and how do we respond to that to protect our coastal environment. So, um, First thing I want to say is, um, yeah, so you, you, you may have, uh, there's a mix of people. We've got people who are much inland and nowhere near the coast, and that's completely normal. We've got other people who are right on the coast and you're not in an outstanding landscape, and that's normal too. So we've got a mixture of things going on tonight. Um, but the similarity or the, um, what, we, what all these environments do have in common is that they're all really special places. So they're special uh, to um, the, the people that live here. They're also special to the people that own the land and live on the land. And we really recognise that. A lot of the land involved, particularly the landscapes, is in public ownership. It's uh, owned by a Department of Conservation within, and within that conservation estate. However, surrounding that and, and certain parts of the district, there's much more that's in private ownership. And um, I just want to really acknowledge um, the people that, that live on that land and, um, and, and that depend on that land in many ways for their livelihoods. So, uh, but we're in this place also where, as well as that, um, these places are special for their histories and their and unique features, and um, they provide people with access to the outdoors and um, you know a general sense of of um, of importance to the people of of Tasman and beyond. So if I just move on to um, the um, Tasman Environment Plan. Now this is uh, a project that some of you may have heard about. Uh, it's, it's a much bigger project. Um, that's a multi-year project. We're talking six to eight years really. Uh, and that's a, a project of developing a new planning document for Tasman. Some of you may be familiar with the Tasman Resource Management Plan. And that's the, um, the plan that we've currently got uh, in place and it's been in existence since about the mid 90s. 
And um, that Tasman Resource Management Plan has, it's been great, it's served its purpose, but it's got a lot of shortcomings, uh, which I'll get onto um, shortly. And so the Tasman Environment Plan is a new project to uh, write a whole new uh, uh, district plan. And some of the components of that are aspects you'll have heard about and some of the components of it we're talking about tonight. So our outstanding natural landscapes and features, uh, that part will, um, will be become part of the Tasman Environment Plan. Equally, our coastal management, uh, our coastal environment area and all the roles associated with the coast, those two will go into the, the Tasman Environment Plan. So the Tasman Environment Plan will form a, um, a comprehensive a plan for Tasman, um, which as I've said there in the slides, it, it's, it's a rule book for what you can or can't do, what you need resource consent for, or what you can just do as of right. And if you do need resource consent, it provides the guidance for whether that consent should be granted and, and what conditions. Moving on to, uh, now I, I mentioned about the, the drivers for these this landscapes and coastal environments project. Uh, and I identify them in two points there. Really, the national legislation is um, one of the key parts of this. Uh, in actual fact, behind the landscapes um, and the coastal areas, the, the legislation is the Resource Management Act, or the RMA. That has been enforced since the early 90s, uh, and it's actually required us to protect, identify and protect landscapes uh, since that early 90s. Um, so some, a lot of this work is overdue in some ways. Um, protection of our coastal areas um, was sort of embodied in legislation since about 2010 and again the legislation requires us to do that so that's that's a big part of what we we have to respond to and, it, and it's quite normal over the whole of the country everybody the whole country has to do it essentially um, and then secondly I've said that um, that we're also responding to community feedback the management and protection and uh, appropriate uh, uh, treatment of these um, areas such as our landscapes and our coast is, is really important to people as well. Uh, mapping of the ONLs and ONFs and the coastal environments available on our website um, and um, we the a, a really key takeaway message for today is about um, that this is the start of a process of uh, of identifying these landscapes and coastal environments um, and the second part, which we haven't um, done yet, it's, it's where we're going to, is about identifying what are the protective controls that we need? What are the rules we need to put in place that will um, strike that balance between allowing people to live on their land, use their land appropriately, but also protecting the values that make them special? So you'll be hearing tonight from a number of the panelists that we want to hear from you um, about what your future aspirations are, what uh, you, know, you may want to use the land for, what uh, we need to protect your land, the, the land for in the future. And so we're really at the start of that conversation. We're not at the end of it. So I think it's important people know that. Uh, and again, this is just a wrap up really for me, just to, uh, to recognise that um, these special places are um, where people live and work and spend time. That's both um, from an ownership point of view, but also um, uh, people who come and spend time in our national parks and the surrounding areas. Uh, it's not about stopping existing uh, legally established activities. If you're using it for certain activities at the moment, whether it be farming or whatever, uh, we're not um, coming along to stop you doing that. Uh, it's about talking about um, how can we enable you to keep doing that, and if there's changes into the future, what might that look like, and what are the, what, what do we write into our Tasman Environment Plan? So um, that's me really, just as a, um, a, a, some um, introductory comments, I'll hand over to Bridget, who will tell us more about the landscapes and uh, special, uh, significant landscapes and uh, features project. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks, Jeremy. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks to everyone for joining us this evening, taking time out. Um, look, I am a landscape architect. My name's Bridget Gilbert. I've got um, 25, over 25 years experience providing landscape advice as an independent consultant um, to councils, private landowners and developers across New Zealand on studies of this type, determining um, the outstanding natural landscapes and features. Um, tonight, I just really briefly like to talk to, to sort of two aspects of the study. The first is the methodology and the second is the findings. Um, the methodology for these landscape studies in New Zealand is um, very well established um, through quite a lot of environment court case law. So the long and the short of it is that this methodology used in the Tasman landscape study is the same as the 
methodology that is used in other districts and um, throughout New Zealand. So there's nothing different there that has been done. Um, in this particular study, we've um, had the benefit of a peer review process as we've worked through the study, and that's been provided by James Bentley from Boffermiskel, who's going to talk shortly about the coastal environment. And what that does is just provides that checks and balances process as we work through to make sure um, the, the methodology and the findings are credible and justified. Um, also quite particular to Tasman is the very high geological values that you have in the district. And for that reason, um, I worked very closely with uh, Dr. Bruce Hayward, who is a geologist and could really inform um, the geoscience inputs into the landscape study, which is a very specialist field. The, um, moving on to the findings, um, you may have been able to access the Outstanding Natural Landscape and Features Mapping and also the report, which is a, a substantial um, document. But in summary, we or well, I identified seven outstanding natural landscapes and 33 outstanding natural features throughout the district. For the outstanding natural landscapes, um, they cover approximately 70% of the district. However, 92% of that coverage is comprises national park and the conservation estate. So there's actually 3.7% of the district that is in private ownership, and a degree of that will be pastoral land use that has been identified as outstanding natural landscape. And I suspect, I would expect that that is what a lot of the attendees tonight will be very interested in, how this particular, um, what's called a landscape overlay affects your, your um, property. Uh, for the ONFs, the outstanding natural features, they, are, they tend to be far more confined um, mapped areas that simply respond to the extent of the geological feature. Um, so whilst there's 33 of them, they only take up 0.51% of the district. Now, the other part of the findings, we've got the mapping, and an important part of um, the landscape study was also the preparation of schedules for each of the outstanding natural landscapes and outstanding natural features. And the purpose of the schedules is to clearly describe the landscape attributes and values that we need to protect. Those are the things. Is it large tracts of bush? Is it particularly spectacular cast landforms? those sorts of elements. But the other side of the coin is we also use the schedules to describe the sorts of activities and developments that are appropriate in that particular outstanding natural landscape or feature. So for example, where the an ONL captures pastoral farmland, there will be recognition in the schedule that that is part and parcel of that landscape together with farm cottages and rural dwellings and rural sheds, farm tracks, et cetera. So very much from my perspective is to gain an insight from people as to what they um, consider should be included in the schedules as um, in recognition of what is occurring on your land and also in due course refinement of mapping lines potentially on a site by site basis. So thank you very much. I will pass on now to Jane. Thanks Bridget. <clears throat> um, my name is James Bentley. I'm a landscape architect um, with approximately 20 years experience. Um, I've undertaken quite a lot of coastal studies around the country, um, particularly in the South Island. Um, and I 
I'm therefore quite familiar with um, the outputs of what needs to be achieved through this process. Um, so I really hope that um, those that are listening today really had an opportunity to view the document online um, and to sort of try and um, understand um, lots of its, um, its contents. There's lots of pictures, so um, get involved if you can to have a look at it. Um, but essentially, the coastal study is really a vitally important piece of work because it's looking at managing our coastal environment um, and how we do that in a way that recognises and protects those special parts of the um, coastal environment, um, those sensitivities and characteristics that, that, that can be appropriately managed in a way that can uh, keep them protected. Um, the coastal studies, you can imagine, includes the marine component, so all the way out to the 12 uh, nautical mile limit, which is the council's jurisdiction, plus includes all the land. Um, so the land is really tricky because we have to define where the edge of that coastal environment is. Um, and with Tasman being a highly varied district, that coastal environment line changes all over the place, depending on the type of topography, depending on the type of um, inlets and waters and lagoons and that sort of thing. Um, so we've had to take a really close look in some areas to try and define how we determine that line um, in, in, on the terrestrial or on the land side. Um, and this can mean that there can, can be some areas of, of land and it, depend, it, it doesn't matter what's happening on the land, there can be a whole variety of things. Um, it's in the coast or it isn't. Uh, so we're not just looking at special parts that are part of the coastal environment, we're looking at all land. Uh, so you can have parts of the land, uh, the landscape that are quite, uh, that the line goes, um, uh, further back into the into the land and away from the coast, and then others that are quite skinny um, parts that are very close to the marine environment. So that includes all all the land where the, there is coastal processes or influences which are quite significant, including coastal lakes, lagoons, estuaries, all those sort of things that you expect to find in the coastal um, the coastal landscape. So the coastal study itself took a really comprehensive approach over how that was undertaken. So you'll, you'll, you'll have a look and see in the study that there's quite a few pages in the front of the document that explain the methodology um, in how we tried to determine that. And a lot of that was framed through um, best practice um, and also through court decisions around the country that have helped to inform how the methodology has been developed. Um, so after defining the extent of the coastal environment, which uh, was also helped by a number of external practitioners. So we had lots of people from DOC, we had um, lots of people from the council um, and other sort of specialist ecologists that were um, brought in to be part of this study. We also looked at how natural that coastal environment is. So when we've defined the study limits, we need to look at how natural that is. And that's where the rubber really hits the road in looking at those high levels of naturalness in, in the coastal environment of where appropriate management um, needs to be um, applied. And through that process, um, a lot of it was undertaken from a sort of an aerial view, a desktop and, and information view, but also there was quite a lot of site visits that were undertaken, all from private roads, uh, uh, sorry, from public roads uh, and from public footpaths. Um, and uh, there was an aerial visit that also helped us to understand um, the breadth of, of the coastal environment. Um, as Bridget said about the landscape study, um, the coastal study also was peer reviewed and Bridget was the peer reviewer for that. Um, again, to ensure that the, the, that the study was going in the right direction. Um, so along with the landscape study, uh, the coastal study also has a series of uh, tables, which articulates as those values uh, and those characteristics of those areas that are special in the coastal environment. And they're all um, contained within the, doc, within the coastal environment study, which is on the council website. So I really do hope that you have an opportunity to look through that. If you've got any questions, I'll be really happy to answer those um, in the second half of this webinar. Thanks so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Stiles and I'm a planner. I'm based in Christchurch, but I work everywhere other than Christchurch these days, all around the South Island, working with people like yourselves and the councils, looking at these kind of topics and working through how to establish policy and provisions 
for protection of landscapes, coastal areas and the like. My role in this project is to take the combination of the technical work that people like James and Bridget have done for us and put that together with the national requirements that Jeremy mentioned under the Resource Management Act and the legal requirements we have to meet and then meld that together with the views and requirements of the community, the landowners and the stakeholders. And what we want to do is work with you to work through not only how to identify these areas, but then also how to manage activities within them, all for the purpose of protecting the areas that have got special values for future generations. And a part of that is really important to really understand what everyone's doing on the land now, but also to try to talk to people about what future uses people want to do on their properties, changes of the use of the land. As, as Jeremy and others have pointed out, this whole work is done from the basis of what's there today. So we're not looking at changing what is done on the land today. If you're farming, that's great. We're wanting to look ahead to see what kind of things you can continue to do or change doing that will still protect the values that have been identified as being special, whether they be landscape or coastal. And we are required in giving that protection to consider putting in place rules. And the key with those rules is to make sure that they're really focused on protecting the values, not just rules for the sake of it, but to cover the particular types of activities that could damage those values. So typical kinds of rules for these types of areas are things like major earthworks. So stopping major changes to the land, both physically and visually. I'm sure you can all imagine big scars on the landscape. We've seen tracks across hillsides being very topical in the media as having a real impact on landscape values. There's also particular rules that often are used for these areas to control the scale and location of buildings so that they're not visually prominent and damaging those visual qualities. Um, we're really early in this process. We're coming out to you early to talk to you about what we're doing and what it means so that there's plenty of time to talk to everybody to talk through where the lines sit and whether they are in the right place or need to move because that's not set in stone and to talk to you about what the process means on the ground. We are doing as much as we can to try to talk to everyone. So this, this evening and these events are just one of our, our pieces of trying to get out and talk to people. We've got a website set up, the one that you should all have the link to and it's um, available through the council's website. It's got the maps, it's got the technical studies, it's got the feedback form to get in touch with us. There's an email address to get in contact and a phone number. And really, really importantly, we wanna come and talk to you all and talk to you about your site specific issues because everyone's got different views and different locations. We're in the process of setting up events to come out all across the district to talk to everyone and that's scheduled for the end of May for a couple of weeks. And we're in the process of trying to figure out how many places we can get to to meet with you all. We'll have the details of that sorted soon and we'll put those details on the website. We really want to talk to you about this project. So please get in touch. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, so hopefully that gave you um, a really good overview beyond um, what you may have read in the letter and on the website. Um, so we now move to the part of this evening um, where we take your questions um, and put them to our panellists. So I see we've had about a dozen questions come in, um, there's eight, but some of them are multi-part. Um, so I'm going to get started on those. Um, for those that weren't with us at the beginning of the presentation, the way to ask a question is at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. So if you click that button, a wider box opens up type your question in and submit it and it'll come through to me and I can put it to our panelists. Um, we aim to get through as many questions as we can, but for those we're not able to answer today, um, we'll get in touch with you via email um, after this session. Probably not this evening, um, but before the end of the week. Okay, so. 
first question um, is from an anonymous attendee um, as to whether or not you can opt out of this process if you want to. Um, so, Jeremy, can you answer that, whether this is a process, I guess, a bit more around kind of, um, yeah, I guess, the requirement yeah, for sure. ONL or CE? Sure. Um, yeah. No. The um, the short answer is uh, is no. It's um, it's some work that's uh, it's as we mentioned is required by legislation. Um, just to get a little bit technical, um, it's a matter of national importance under the Resource Management Act, and that matter of national importance essentially says that there's a duty upon the council uh, to identify and protect. Uh, landscapes um, or significant natural landscapes and features. So that's something that we need to do. Um, and as Bridget mentioned, some of the some of the, the tricky stuff, the, the devil being in detail is around, well, what is a natural landscape? And, and um, so, so that's really what we're working out here. Um, there's a methodology for doing that, but if a site is identified as being in a outstanding natural landscape or indeed in the coastal environment, then no, it's not something you can opt out of. Uh, it's a, um, a council and community decision-making process through the Resource Management Act to identify those and identify um, appropriate rules and policies for those areas. Thanks, Jeremy. And um, we've had a question come in from Tim. Um, he wants to know how do, do people know what is in the schedule um, around their use um, and how they're impacted? So I guess it's two part there really, which is, Bridget, if I can get you to speak to talk about um, what's in the schedules and then Stephanie to talk about um, how we're going to go about determining um, what those impacts might look like. Certainly. Um, good question, Tim. Um, what I'd suggest you do is have a look at the landscape study online and there is a section in the study, section D, which sets out the outstanding natural landscape schedules and section E sets out the outstanding natural natural feature schedules. Now each of those schedules um, describes in quite a lot of detail the, um, the attributes and values of the landscape and it's broken up into three sections. Biophysical, this is getting a bit technical, so um, I, I might not stray into that right now, but I suggest you have a look at those descriptions to understand what is um, considered to be really valuable about the particular ONL that you're interested in. And then the next part of this was, what does it mean? What it means is that those schedules that Bridget's developed have identified for all of these different outstanding natural landscapes, the seven big areas and the 33 small areas, what the specific values are. So they differ from area to area. And Bridget's developed a, a set of guidance around what are the values specific to each area? What things could be reasonably anticipated as occurring in that landscape or feature without impacting on those values and what types of activities are likely to have significant values. For example, if it's a small geological feature, doing something like major earthworks or mining is probably going to have quite an impact on that geology. What we're doing now as part of this current process is talking to people about what's going on and what they think they might do in the future Obviously, we don't know all of the answers, but we put that together with the guidance that we've got from the Environment Court and other, uh, other processes to work through what kind of activities need to be constrained in some way to protect the identified values. And there's a whole lot more information in Bridget's study about what that means, if you have the opportunity to look that through. And, okay. Thanks, um, Stephanie. Can I just tack on a wee comment there? Um, it, it's been noted in the past that some of those schedules are quite hard to read on the online version. Um, now, it can be a, a bit tricky, um, but what we do also have um, is at, from the start of next week, uh, the technical documents will be in the service centres uh, in Motueka, Tasman and um, 
uh, Murchison. Uh, and also, of course, they'll be available when we have the drop-in sessions. So if you're not able to read it online or indeed not able to access it online because, um, because of your connectivity, um, there is access to the hard copy documents as well, which are probably easier to read. Thank you. Um, a question here from Ben um, that I guess speaks to um, ultimately um, that, that the land is still remaining um, in, in the ownership of, 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 the, of the property owner. Um, but Bridget, I'm, I'm going to see whether maybe this is one for you. Um, he says, if, you, if, as you say, the ONF are mostly in current crown ownership, I DOP, are we not just increasing this land area by the impositions brought about by the ONF land identification with this landscape overlay that is currently privately owned? So question there really is, are we not just expanding the DOC estate um, by including all this privately owned land? What is it that, that um, I guess, keeps it in... Um, yeah, in, in the control yes. of, of, the, of the owner. Yes, I'll do my best to answer that, Ben. Um, from a landscape assessment perspective, land ownership is not a factor. It just so happens that, I think it was 92% of the ONL um, coverage in the district is a national park or conservation estate. However, that is not a driver of it being um, um, an ONL. So, so um, we're, we're not in the realms of um, identifying ONLs in any way to try and capture it, that area, as um, new conservation estate or national park or anything like that. It's fully recognised that its land is in private ownership. And I guess this comes back to um, what Stephanie was speaking to around the schedules clearly stating what are the sort of things that are going on on that private land what are the sort of things that people want to be able to do on their private land? And considering, can we, can we allow certain things while still maintaining and protecting those landscape values? Thanks, Bridget. Um, we've had a question come in from Faith Connell, um, who I believe is, is asking questions on behalf of somebody based in London. And um, so, good morning. And, and, and the question is around the fact that their land, which they intend to build on in the next few years, is just within the line of the Able Tasman Outstanding Natural Landscape. So they're wanting to know, can they petition to be outside of that Outstanding Natural Landscape area? Um, and will that status of being an Outstanding Natural Landscape mean that in the near future, their right to build residential properties could be restricted or, or forbidden entirely? So Bridget, can you speak to the, the boundary question um, and then Stephanie to um, what that might mean for them in terms of their residential build aspirations? Certainly. Um, in terms of the boundary, Faith, um, that, that is one of the aspects that we really want to cover off in the... Um, the consultation exercise that we're doing in a few weeks time coming around the district and speaking to people individually will have large printed maps and we can actually look at your property and see you know is the ONL line exactly in the right place or does it need to be tweaked um, so there's that process that lies ahead and I might just jump in about the house idea um, and Stephanie, I'm sure, will correct me um, if I go off piste. Um, but certainly the Able Tasman ONL, there are a number of houses already within the Able Tasman ONL. So there is a context there of a tolerance of um, a, a degree of um, rural living, basically. Um, so it, it's, it, it, to my mind, it um, would be very unlikely that you couldn't build. However, it, it does need to be carefully considered in the context of your particular property. And Brid Bridget's really articulated that well. The, the key here is not about simply saying whether you can or can't do something. It's an, often a matter of, of scale and location 
very few of these areas, these, these big landscape areas, are likely to have outright prohibition on them. It's about doing things sensitively. So an example that I've used previously with people is if someone wanted to put a three-story bright pink um, house on the top of a hill, that probably is going to have an effect on the values of that landscape. But if people want to put even a multitude of well-designed, discreetly located buildings that fit into the landscape, there should be no problem with those. And, and it's, so it's really a, a, a nature of context, scale, and, and the, the details of any particular proposal that would be worked through in detail as a part of a, a future process. What we're trying to do right now is get the areas right and get the concepts around the rules in place that, that are targeted towards the protection of the values. Thank you. And I'll just add um, that while we can't cover um, details of um, individual properties and how particular parcels of land in the specifically might be affected through through this channel, through the webinar tonight. Um, you'll see that we have got the web address um, on your screen. If you go to that website, the environmentplan.tasman.govt.nz, click through to the landscapes and the coastal projects tab. If you just scroll down, there's a website form. Fill that in, let us know um, if you would rather have a phone call or email contact with us um, and we can, um, one of the friendly panellists um, will be in touch with you um, to, to discuss your situation a bit more. Um, and so, yeah, we're happy to make international calls as well, if that helps. Um, question here, what involvement, if any, has been made by the Tasman Environmental Trust into the process to identify locations of conservation significance? Um, so that's really a question there around um, that Tasman Environmental Trust in particular as a stakeholder, but just generally um, how a stakeholder is being engaged. So. Um, Bridget or Stephanie, who would like to pick that one up? Sort of at, at, at the point now, aren't we really of, of starting to engage with stakeholders? Yeah, I can jump in here. We, we, as I said before, are really just starting this process. We wanted to come out and make contact with the landowners first. Um, the next part of that is working through contacting all the different stakeholders and groups and, and bodies that are involved in this. So that the studies that James and Bridget have done have been informed by a lot of technical inputs, particularly desk-based, so reports and studies and talking to technical experts. They haven't at this stage been informed by community-based groups and stakeholder representatives. That will come through this current process that we're launching on and many, many meetings and phone calls that are yet to come. Cool. Um, a question here, for James around what plans are being made or considered to mitigate potential coastal inundation for current properties that were outside the previous flood zones but affected in the new plan. So how does kind of coastal inundation, sea level rise, um, that whole kind of climate change mix, um, how's that been considered through your work? Yeah, certainly that's a good question. Um, very topical as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that has sort of been influenced to some de degree in the natural character study but uh, and, the, and the coastal environment study, but I think the question is broader than that. Um, and I'm just wondering, Jeremy, do, would you like to just comment on the sort of the climate change or coastal hazard work that's also being um, undertaken? Because of course, this, this, this doesn't just relate to one, one topic here, does it? Sure, no, absolutely. Uh, so I mentioned earlier about the Tasman Environment Plan and that these projects are components of that bigger plan. Well, as, um, as you say, James, we've got a number of other projects going on uh, and um, they relate to, I guess, topically, they relate to coastal hazard. Uh, there's other topics around um, ecological protection, uh, protection of significant uh, natural areas uh, and, and so on. Those are all work streams which are also being carried out by um, staff within TD, Tasman District Council. Um, it's just that this pro these two projects, um, ONFLs and uh, the Coastal Environment projects, are quite well advanced. And we need to slice and dice these projects and slice and dice how we bring them to, um, to the relevant uh, landowners. So we're coming along with these, but yes, there are other projects. Um, I think some of the coastal hazard work will be, um, be coming out in the months to come, sort of mid to sort of third quarter, I think, uh, of 2021. And that will obviously tie into this. Um, and, and I guess that's our job as planners to kind of knit it all together. Um, 
but um, yeah, what we're just trying to do is trying to divvy it up and, and talk to these different um, these different aspects. Um, there's a question also for James around, are there similar schedules um, for the coastal environment to better understand the changes from the current regime? Um, so that that's being the, the Tasman Resource Management Act um, versus what's, what we're looking at, the Tasman Environment Plan. So can you talk a little bit about what we've got at the moment, maybe in terms of... Yeah, so um, I don't think we have much, uh, maybe Jeremy's the best place to answer this as well. I don't think there's much in the existing plan around the coastal environment in terms of schedules, is that Jeremy? Uh, as much. No, there isn't, no. So what we've got in our current uh, Tasman Resource Management Plan is um, a kind of a blanket 200 metre ribbon around the coast, if you like. It's uh, um, it, it, it's it sort of set as a nominal width. So, and I think probably a lot of people who are in this on that coastal edge will be aware of that. That if you're in that 200 metre coastal environment area, then you need to, um, uh, if you were going to build a building or extend a building, then you need to get resource consent for that. And that is the only real effect of that coastal environment area that we've currently got. So now we're moving, so the work that James is doing is to create a new coastal environment uh, um, area, which um, isn't just a blanket 200, but it all varies. It comes and goes, sometimes it's quite slender and close to the coast, sometimes it's much more extensive and it'll be much wider. Uh, and, and it more reflects what is the actual coastal environment rather than just a nominal 200 meters. So um, no, we don't, that, uh, and, and it's also uh, likely that the new uh, coastal environment area and the new rules that Stephanie's working on uh, will um, will be a bit more extensive than just dealing with uh, buildings. They may well also cover earthworks. Uh, they may cover um, coastal um, protection uh, and and other activities that are often taken out in that coastal margin uh, beyond just building. Yeah, and those um, those schedules that will be um, part of the plan that's identified through this new coastal work will highlight all sorts of um, living, non-living, and experiential aspects of the coastal environment that um, are important um, to be protected. So I think at least when we start looking at framing rules, as we've said about landscape, the same as in the coastal environment, when we start framing any uh, management um, mechanism around how we deal and manage these coastal, special coastal areas, there will be schedules in the, in the plan that will at least highlight what those special things are that we're trying to protect. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Claude about the concrete blocks left for years on the Motueka beach. Um, so that's not something that's directly covered by this project, um, but if you email us at the email address on the screen, um, we can try and find out for you um, what the status is um, of that. Got a question about what the 3% of privately owned land adds to the 97% of land and public ownership in the ONL areas. Um, and that Question comes from Tim, who's later gone on to write really kind of that he doesn't have a crystal ball and know what's going to happen or how his values might change. So how can we say what to what as a landowner what they expect regarding their future land use? So what's the justification for placing restraints? So I guess the couple of questions tied into that are really um, you know, what's what's the purpose of this? Is it is it really needed in that there's already um, a lot of land in public ownership covered by um, an outstanding natural landscape? and um, what's the justification for those future restraints. So Bridget, can you speak to um, why we still need to go into those privately owned areas with this study? Um, and then Stephanie, can you speak to kind of the justification why we need restraints if, if current landowners aren't, aren't planning to do anything detrimental and in many cases actually will be looking after the land, um, yeah, in a, in a wonderful way. Um, so Bridget. Thanks, Tim. Um, look, the long and the short of it is the way the established way of doing landscape assessment um, is looking at what is actually there um, rather than looking at who owns the land. So I appreciate your comments that will, you know, what does the 3% add to the vast National Park and Conservation Estate, um, you know, when you look at, look at it boldly like that, it's an interesting question. However, that 3% is scattered around the district and 
that, that, that land of, that's covered by the 3% forms part of the um, important, um, well, not context, it's actually part of the landscape that is deemed to be outstanding. So to excise the private land would be artificial and methodologically incorrect. So hopefully that assists. And then my bit of the answer in relation to why we have to protect it, again, is, is a similar thing. It's it's a requirement, as Jeremy set out, that we once we've identified these areas and what the values are, we need to protect those values. So the, the really key part of what we're doing here is trying to understand what people are doing today and what's reasonable use that fits with those values. So when you've got a farm and it's in this, this outstanding landscape, the process that Bridget's gone through with those schedules is to identify what types of things are going on now, whether it be buildings, farm buildings and tracks and those kind of things that fit into that existing outstanding landscape and, and will be able to continue, continue to be used and developed. It's where you make major changes to the land form or the land cover or the land use that change, fundamentally change those values that have been identified. So that's why I keep coming back to things like large buildings, lots of buildings, uh, covering pastoral landscapes, for example, in a monoculture of pine plantations that mean that you can't see the shape of the land. Um, major open cast earthworks and those kind of things. We're, we're talking about big change. We're not talking about small, discrete, well-located activities. And, and that, that's the task that we're all faced with is working out what is okay and what's a step too far. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so that fits nicely with the question that Ben's asked about if he wishes to increase the number of dwellings on, on their property. Um, will the application to do so be affected by the new Tasman environment plan? So I guess the first thing is, is it within an ONL and ONF or in the new CE area? Um, but yeah, can you maybe talk a little bit about how Ben could go about finding out more about whether um, his, his, he may potentially be restricted from doing that and how he can let us know? Yeah, absolutely. The, the first thing to do is to look at those maps on the website and determine which of the layers affect that your property and then go into those technical reports and look at what the schedules for that particular landscape or coastal environment are saying about what's special about that area. You'll also see in the technical studies really good identification of the kinds of activities at a high level that have been identified as being acceptable, good, positive or neutral and those that have been identified at this stage as probably being bad. Now that doesn't mean that, for example, all earthworks might be bad. It might be a scale size. So we might be saying things like, like normal small farming tracks are okay, but large scale mining's not okay. And, and that, that kind of information will come through from those technical reports. Look at your area, look at what applies in the reports, and if you have any doubt, get in touch and we'll work through it with you. Um, since we're talking about, you mentioned mining there as an example, and Joyce Wiley's asked a follow up to your, um, to around kind of open cast mines, and is it still possible for the existing use to continue with the quarries that are already active? So she's thinking about Dolomite and Lime there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. There's all sorts of different scale quarries, mines, and those kind of activities throughout the district. If, in a, 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 for example, a quarry is, is established now and is either legally established with what's called existing use rights, so it's been there a long time, or has got a resource consent that it was working under, those kind of activities are provided for, they're permitted to continue so long as they, <clears throat> excuse me, remain within the conditions of their consent or the parameters of what's permitted. We're looking very much at new activities and changes that happen from now going forward. 
Um, we've got a question about um, the ability for someone who's had considerable storm damage that they haven't cleared yet. So they had 70% of their trees have fallen over and laid there since. Is there anything that could restrict them from removing these and the two meter regrowth scrub trees? How much of this can they clear? So I think the point there is that if you've got um, anything at the moment isn't covered by what we're talking about here, because this is about preparing for the future. Um, so there's nothing in this current piece of work around the outstanding natural landscapes, outstanding natural features and the coastal environment um, work that we're doing that would prevent you from doing that. However, there may be other things that prevent you from doing that that I'm not aware of. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in on this question. Um, but it may be something that's better to email council about. Um, there's nothing that I'm aware of, um, but that's not to say that there aren't other rules or restrictions elsewhere um, that may prevent you from doing some of that. But at this stage, absolutely not. Yeah, I think Another key issue there, Nicole, is the timeframes we're talking about. As Jeremy mentioned, this isn't a quick process. Changing, reviewing these types of documents takes a long time and the in, any new rules that get developed over these next few years won't be coming into place tomorrow or even this year they'll be a few years out the the council's looking at notifying the new rules in 2024 so things that you're considering doing between now and then are under the current rules not these new provisions we're talking about that's a really really important point and there's a question from Glenn about if um, he needs to add a new track on the farm to improve the efficiency of the farming business after this comes into effect. Is that going to be possible under the new rules? So Stephanie, I know again it's that uh, specific case, but um, is there anything we can add about, about um, yeah, tracks that may need to be put in to enable that current use to kind of continue to work? It's really, really difficult without knowing, you know, where and how big and how visible and which landscape we're talking about. Um, it would be a great question to work through with Glenn specifically so that we, we've got it in context. Uh, as a really general comment, some farm tracks are just fine. They're really discreet. Others can be a real eyesore and... It's not a simple yes or no, it's contextual, it's site specific. And this question about the Resource Management Act being under review and what differences we think this will make to the designations and consequences. So um, Resource Management Act being the act that's requiring this work, it is being repealed and replaced by three new pieces of legislation. Um, but Jeremy can probably tell us a little bit more about um, yeah, where he thinks that's gonna land and what it might mean for this process. Yes, um, that is something of an elephant in the room. Uh, we, um, I think probably everyone's aware that um, there's political consensus to repeal the Resource Management Act. Uh, so um, we're all coming to terms with the fact that that's going to disappear and be replaced with new legislation. Uh, we've sought some guidance on that uh, and we've seen um, uh, um, some of the direction that that new legislation is going. Um, the guidance that we've got from the minister um, has really been along the lines of um, keep doing what you're doing. We don't see any prospect that uh, these kind of requirements are going to just uh, magically go away. Um, they'll, um, in either the same or a very similar form, from a planning point of view, um, they'll be included in the new legislation. So uh, as I say, the, the, the guidance to us as planners was um, just um, keep going with our new Tasman Environment Plan. And uh, as we go on and as the new legislation comes um, comes forward, well, we may need to adjust and tweak what we do and maybe some of the, uh, the tests and the, the actual detail and the technical stuff might uh, need to be adjusted, but fundamentally this is work that we'll need to um, carry on regardless. And Jeremy, just while we've got you, um, so can you clarify that some areas might be both in, a, in an outstanding natural landscape and within the coastal environment? Yes, absolutely. So uh, I mean, yeah, I mentioned at the start that there's two projects we're talking about here. Uh, the uh, outstanding natural landscapes and features are generally, generally more inland. They cover a lot of our big hill country, uh, um, you know, the national parks, Kaurangi, and so on. Um, but yes, they do extend up into um, northwest Nelson, uh, you know, up to up Farewell Spit. Uh, the um, there's an outstanding natural feature is Farewell Spit itself. Golden Bay, the wet bit of Golden Bay, the watery bit, is all identified as a um, 
outstanding natural landscape. Wainui Bay is identified as an outstanding natural landscape. And so those are some examples of outstanding natural landscapes, which also happen to be on the coast. So, uh, and then we have our coastal study, which is obviously purely uh, the wet bit of the coast and the sliver of dry bit that James has explained. So uh, they, they don't necessarily overlap, but in, a lot, in some cases, particularly those Golden Bay cases, they do. Uh, around towards sort of the more Waimea end of things, Mapua through to Richmond, uh, no, there is no overlap. We've got the coastal strip and then the la outstanding landscapes are more up in the, the Richmond Ranges uh, the, and, and up towards Nelson Lakes and, and so on. So they're quite separate there. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, a question about what support will TDC provide to, to support natural landscapes outside of restricting use, so outside of this project, um, I'm aware of a few pieces of council work um, in this area, so it was sort of um, you've got planting days, community planting days, um, things like um, Jobs for Nature, which is government funding that the TDC looks after um, to support kind of um, workers to do to do work to help restore our environment. Um, there are a number of programs. If you're interested in knowing more about those or connecting up with some community groups who are doing some really good um, kind of restoration and protection work, um, email us and we can try and connect you. Okay. Um, a question about some natural features will not be allowed inappropriate earthworks. How and who defines what is appropriate? Stephanie? Um, yeah, so the first, the first place to find information about that is, is in the technical studies, um, particularly Bridget's, where she's, she's looked at some of those uh, geopreservation sites and geological features, which are the outstanding natural features, and identified particularly for those that large-scale earthworks are probably going to have a severe impact on the geology and the, the nature of those features. Um, again, we can't be absolute at this stage. I suspect it's something that we're going to work through on a case-by-case -case basis for each of these landscapes and features. But the smaller the feature, the more likely that any earthworks will have a significant effect. And in the, the, the opposite, the bigger an area, the more capacity there is for things like earthworks to occur without damaging the values. Um, I might just jump in there and clarify that I think you're talking about the outstanding natural features and um, Dr. Bruce Hayward and I have class actually classified the features. I think from memory, there's five different um, feature types and what has happened in other districts, and it may be something that Tasman explores, we're at a very early stage at this, at, at this point in time, but for each different type of feature, there is a different earthworks threshold in recognition of that variance. Um, so that's you know, one of the tools that we'll be looking into, I suspect. Um, we're meant to be signing off at this point, but there's a couple of really important questions that I just want to quickly get to. Um, and if that's all right, we'll repeat myself if you can stay for two more moments. Um, so one question, a couple of questions that come in um, around whether there's any um, kind of funding or compensation um, to help um, people who, who may um, need to go for future resource consents under this. Um, there's a comment that resource consents could be quite high. Um, and yeah, just concerned that, that resource consent applications will end up becoming notified and that adds a huge amount of cost and time and just generally uncertainty. So Stephanie, can you talk about that? Yeah, um, resource consents can be um, costly, but what, what we'll be looking to do is to try to tailor the rules so that it's really clear that things that are probably okay that need to go through a simple level of consent should have a quick streamlined and, and simple process. So for example houses that are well designed and well located should be a quick and simple resource consent process to confirm that they're, they're, they're good. If you wanted to do something significant that was going to have significant effects that's where you're probably going to be 
looking at potential public notification and lengthy and costly resource consents. So what, what we're really trying to do with this new set of provisions is to be really clear which things are permitted without a consent, which things need a simple, straightforward, low cost, quick consenting process, and which things are damaging to the values and therefore need to be dealt with rigorously. And the, the process for determining things like whether something is notified or not is, is all set out through the Resource Management Act. So it, it doesn't come down to uh, a necessarily a, a something that's specified in the plan. It's specific to a proposal. Thank you. Um, we really are at time. I can see that um, Adriana's come back clarifying the question, um, that it's not about the existing projects of landscape restoration, but when there are caveats of land use on privately owned property because of the outstanding natural features, what motivation does TDC um, kind of wrap around, I guess, to support landowners to protect these outstanding natural landscapes. Um, so I imagine that's still kind of next steps to come um, in terms of um, Stephanie's work. Um, but again, we've got your email address, um, so we'll be able to get back to you on that. Um, also, Joyce Wiley has asked about um, when you get feedback, how do you weigh the submissions? So some, some people have skin in the game, where they, they live and work and, and then they're living off of the landscapes, um, whereas there'll be other people who have an opinion but aren't affected. And um, so I think with that, it really it's key in the sense that we've come out to landowners first, really. Um, we're talking to you now um, and we need your feedback throughout this process. And um, so that's, that's really why um, we're gonna be kind of touring the district to, to speak to landowners um, to hear from you. And we encourage um, you all to, to get in touch with us via the website, the email, the phone number, um, and to come out and, and see us when we're at those open days near you. Um, so you've got the web address in front of you um, on that questions and answers page. But if you look up the Tasman Environment Plan on Google, um, our website will come up and you'll be able to go to the Landscapes and Coastal Environment Project tab um, to access the studies that we've talked about today um, and to give us some feedback. So thank you so much for joining us um, in, in giving up your evening um, or morning as the case may be. Um, and hopefully you found that useful. Um, you can give us feedback on this session um, or, or anything in the process to date um, via the website. Thank you.